my focus is not to have the outlier, so to speak, not the person who made a million dollars in their first year. Many of those videos on YouTube and, you know, respect to them for doing so well. But that is an outlier for me. I want to have people on here who are more representative of people who are just starting out so that they can offer those actionable tips which they use to grow in the last couple of years. That is the most relevant thing for majority of people. Anything related to entrepreneurship, anything related to where you can run your business successfully, that's what I'm basically trying to do. Welcome to another episode of Listeners to Leads, where I'm helping podcasters launch and maintain a lead generating show. I'm your host, Alicia Galati, the CEO and head podcast strategist behind Galati Media, a full service podcast management company. On this show, you'll hear my guests and I discuss everything it takes to launch a successful podcast and keep it running. If you're ready to get leads, land speaking gigs, and create deeper connections with your audience through your podcast, then this is the show for you. Welcome back. Today we are talking to Tarek, and I'm so excited for you to kind of hear his journey into a video first podcast. And yes, we talk about that during the episode and his decision to do video and what that kind of looks like from a planning perspective, as well as a content perspective for him and his guests and how he has to show up on video and how that's very different from an audio first podcast. But then we also talk very heavily on making sure that the content that you're creating on your show, on your podcast is going to be valuable for your audience, that you have to be strategic about the people that you actually have on your show, and you have to make sure that you are putting your audience first when you decide on your guests. So this episode is so good. I feel like I talk about this all the time with you guys on this show, but I think it's good to have another perspective and someone who is doing it right, in my opinion. So join me in welcoming Tarek to the show. Hello, Tarek. Thank you so much for being here today. I am so excited to chat with you. Hello, Alicia. Thank you for having me. I'm excited as well. So if you could just start by telling everyone who you are, what you do, and about your show. Sure. My name is Tarek, as you mentioned. I'm from the beautiful city of Toronto, Canada. And the name of my podcast slash YouTube channel is The S Factor, where S stands for success. So essentially what we try to do is find success factors of our guests. Now, mainly the channel is directed towards new entrepreneurs, business owners, or, you know, self-employed people or people who are just looking to switch from going from working nine to five to maybe something of their own. So majority of our guests are business owners. And what we try to find is their success factors and what makes them successful. And essentially, one of the things I should mention right off the bat about the show is that we have a mix of various different people on the show. We publish once a week. So far, we've published about 24-ish episodes. And essentially, one of the things I've done is that I've had really successful people on there who own eight-figure businesses. And I've had people who've been doing their own thing, running their own Etsy shop, for example, for about a couple of years. And they're maybe making 10 grand a month or something like that. So my focus is not to have the outlier, so to speak, not the person who made a million dollars in their first year on Etsy, for example. Many of those videos on YouTube and, you know, respect to them for doing so well. But that is an outlier for me. And I want to have people on here who are more representative of people who are just starting out so that they can offer those actionable tips, which they use to grow in the last couple of years. That is the most relevant thing for majority of people, for 99%, right? So that is what I try to do. And the third category of people I have are professionals. 
people, for example, working at Google who can talk about strategy, who can talk about transformation. I've had a gentleman who was head negotiator of their hostage unit for a police force for 20 years. So he taught us about negotiation, the four steps to successfully negotiate any kind of deal. And then we had another gentleman talking about credit scores, how to repair your credit score, how to have a good credit score, which will impact your, not only your personal finance, but your business finance as well. So anything related to entrepreneurship, anything related to where you can run your business successfully, that's what I'm basically trying to do. I love that. There's so many different things I want to pull from what you're saying. So you focus really heavily on YouTube. What made you decide that it was going to be a video first podcast, right? Because a lot of people like myself, I'm like, you know, video is great, but I don't really want to have my face on video too much. So I would prefer to just be able to sit here, talk in my microphone, have a great time, connect with my audience that way so that I'm in their ears. But people like yourself, where video first is also a great strategy to have these conversations in. What made you decide that you were going to go the video first route? That's an excellent question. And honestly, it happened by accident. (laughs) It wasn't through planning at all. Just to go back a little bit, essentially what it is, is that I work as a career coach and a consultant for job seekers. So back in 2015, I created a set of videos which will help people get ready for interviews. So how to answer a particular type of question. But I created those videos for an educational platform, not for YouTube. So I don't say, hey, like this video, subscribe to my, none of that stuff, right? It's purely for the purposes of education. What happened is by 2018, I basically stopped making any more money from those videos, right? So at that point, I was sitting around with all these videos and all all this value, I figured. And the thing is that I wasn't really showcasing it anywhere, right? It was just there. So the pandemic happened. And suddenly I found myself with more time on my hands. So I figured, you know what? I got all these videos. I might as well just upload them on YouTube and see what happens. Honestly, I didn't do a very professional job. I didn't do my research to find keywords and to create nice titles or descriptions or none of that stuff. I just uploaded them because, hey, they're here. I might as well just upload them. So I did. And um, I think I was checking uh, in the first couple of weeks or something. I had 26 subscribers. And I thought, wow, this is good. You know, whatever. And then I checked back again. Maybe a couple of months later, I had about 50 or so. And I said, oh, this is all right. This is all right. <laughs> and then a year and a half almost went by. And I hadn't been keeping up with it at all. You know, because I got busier. And what happened was that I had some other videos, which I hadn't uploaded for whatever reason, I just didn't. And then I was at a dinner with some people and someone was talking about YouTube. And I said, hey, why don't you subscribe to my channel? And he goes, yeah, yeah, sure, I will. And then he opened it up on his phone and they were running ads on my video. And I thought, whoa, I thought only popular videos, they would run ads. Otherwise, who's going to watch it? Plus, I'm not getting paid, right? I didn't know anything about the monetization, nothing like that. I was like, oh, they're running ads. I should get paid. And I figured, no, there must be more steps to this. It's not as simple as that. And at that time, what I noticed was that I had over 800 subscribers. Wow. (laughs) And it had just grown. Some of the videos had thousands of views. And I was like, whoa, what is going on here? After that, I think I looked into YouTube. What is the process of monetization? What are some of the things that I can do? So essentially what happened after that is that I wanted to pivot and change things around because I didn't want to go back to interview coaching because how many different ways can you possibly advise people to answer one particular question, right? Yeah. (laughs) And also I didn't want the focus to be on me. So I figured that, you know what? I have always worked with small business owners, other entrepreneurs. So I thought, can I do something here? Because I've been interviewing people 
literally all my, not all my life, but since 2006, when I had a staffing business. So I've been always interviewing people. So this is something which I enjoy. And I always had casual conversations with people, always trying to find out, hey, what did you do which made you successful? I've always asked this question to anybody with even, you know, small bits of success that they have had. I always wanted to find out what are they doing, right? So I thought, you know what, can I do this in a sort of interview format? That's when I started consuming more podcast stuff online on YouTube. So for example, the iced coffee hour or some of those related business related uh, podcasts, right? And I was watching their style. I was listening to them and I thought, you know what? YouTube is the only thing I've got going right now. So I might as well just start with this and we'll see what happens. So it is true that, you know, for yourself, and I do agree with you that When you're just doing audio only, you have the ability to actually have a more informed conversation, if you will, because they're not seeing you take down notes, for example. Mm -hmm. So when I record my stuff on YouTube, I actually have to remember what to go back and ask because some answers from my guests can be long-winded. So the thing is that at that point, I have to go back and say, hey, let's unpack this. You said this, you know, that kind of thing, right? And which leads to more conversation. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think when I first started, and, you know, I'm also learning as I go, right? So when I first started, I was more like, okay, these are the 10 things I'm going to ask. And I'm just going to go with the flow. Just ask one, two, three, four, five. So it wasn't so much of a conversation, like back and forth. It was always about them finishing an answer and me saying, oh, awesome. That's great. And then just moving on to question number two, without actually relaying any other information. One of the things I don't do is summarize stuff. That's just my style. Because I feel that, you know, summarizing is just going back and saying what they have said already kind of thing. Unless I feel that, yes, he's taken seven minutes to answer this question and there's a lot of value here. So maybe if I summarize it on a very high level, then I'm doing okay, right? That's Mm -hmm. something which the audience would prefer. To make a short story long, that's essentially how I started on YouTube. You put your heart and your soul into your show. And I want to help you reach all of those potential listeners out there. That's why I'm excited to announce my upcoming podcast marketing workshop. It's about giving you practical tools to grow your audience. You'll learn the secrets to getting your podcast discovered, attracting your dream listeners, and boosting those download numbers. This workshop will be hosted live with a replay available on April 30th. You can sign up by going to galatimedia.com slash workshop. Let's grow our podcasts together. That's so interesting. And I love, because we talk about this a lot on the show, of like starting messy, right? Mm-hmm. And starting where you are and it doesn't have to be perfect. And you're not going to be this incredible interviewer as soon as you start. And so many people, they start their podcast, they start their show, they start their YouTube channel, and they think, I'm going to get thousands of followers. I'm going to get thousands of downloads. It's going to happen so fast for me. And I love that you gave that kind of timeline of like, hey, it was just sitting there. I was doing a little bit with it. wasn't doing a lot with it. And then all of a sudden, I was like, whoa, what happened? Maybe I should dig into this. And I think that just kind of letting yourself go with the flow, a lot of people don't let themselves do that. So I absolutely love that you did that. Where are you looking to, I mean, you're connecting with these really big, high profile and low profile, but still incredible guests. Where are you finding them? I know a lot of people struggle with like, okay, I've got content for next week. What about the week after? So how are you kind of navigating that with a more interview style show? Yeah. So I think that is one of the biggest challenges when you start. Yeah. Because you see, it's the chicken and the egg situation. 
in order to bring in the high profile guests, you need to have a lot of traction, subscribers, views, etc. But in order to get those, you need to bring in the high profile guests. Yes. So, <laughs> it's, it's like a no win situation. Honestly speaking, it's a no win situation. So one thing that I decided a long time ago, not necessarily a long time ago, in May of this year, because that's when I transitioned to the interview style stuff. I decided at that time was that I was not going to compromise with the quality of the guests. What I mean is that, see, you know, this is just an example. A mental health advocate can add a lot of value, but it's not necessarily aligned to what my audience is about or what my show is about, right? Right. So I can dig into some business aspects, but really then I'm doing a disservice to the guest because we're not talking about business. We're not talking about finance or how to invest or any of those things. So I'm doing a disservice. So I decided a long time ago is that I was not going to compromise with certain things on my channel. So they would have to have a track record of success, which is not just on the, their site, but verified through other sources. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not an investigative show. I don't call myself a journalist or nothing like that. But if I go and search up somebody, you know, just Google, basic Google stuff, I should be able to see something. It shouldn't just be their own profile on their own website, just talking about their success. There should be some third party site or information which I can find and which is actually verifiable. So I always do that. And after doing that, essentially what it is, is that the ratio right now is, uh, or the percentage is about 90% of the people I reach out to don't get back to me. Mm -hmm. And that is just a reality right now. Because what I'm also doing is I'm reaching out to very high profile people. And when I'm doing this, essentially, I know that there is less than 10% chance that they're going to get back to me. But then something good does happen. For example, the other day I reached out to one of the episodes which is coming out is with Mike Chabot. So he has 1.3 million followers on Insta. And he is by far one of the more influential fitness influencers from Canada. Although he lives in the States, but basically he's Canadian. So I wanted to bring him on uh, Canadian success stories that we have one of the series as I wanted to bring him on. And the thing is that before that, I was just looking through, he has done maybe three or four of these podcasts. It's not like he's been on 20 of them. So people who've been on 20 of them are more approachable in the sense that, yes, I've done this and this is like a piece of cake for me. Of course, I'll come, you know, that kind of thing. They want more exposure. But he's apparently more selective because he's been in the limelight for a while now. It's not like, oh, it's an overnight thing. He, you know, he has all these followers and things like, no, he's been there for a while. So, you know what? Things work out. He said, yes, I want to come on the, on the show. And I said, okay. So, <laughs> you know, good things can happen. But the thing is that you have to be patient. Yeah. Majority of the high profile file people I have reached out to, e even with rejections, it's just one or two emails here and there. They are not going to, majority are just not going to answer at all. I do like working with their PR agencies if they have, because at least I know they're looking at the email and they are giving it a serious thought, checking out the channel and things like that. And I think that once you get to a certain stage, you have to get a pitch deck ready for your guests. You have to talk about your subscribers, how you have grown, what is your retention rate on YouTube, which means that are people actually watching your content? It's not just views. You can get thousands of views, like 30 seconds or whatever it is, or you can buy them off the net. But the thing is that are people actually watching? And one of the great things about YouTube is that everything is verifiable. It's not just me saying, 
oh, I got thousands of no, you can go to third party sites like Social Blade or whatever. And they're not always accurate. But the thing is that at least they can give some kind of direction to people who are looking at it. You got to talk about your age and gender mix of your audience. You got to talk about where they're located, their locations, geographic locations, right? Are they in the US? Are they in Canada? Where are they? So the thing is that all those kind of things, you can put it into a package and then you can pitch it to more high profile people because that is what they expect. They want to see the numbers because one of the influencers, she is very popular and she doesn't have like the millions of followers, but she is very popular with brands and things like that. I did reach out to them and their PR came back and said, you know what? You need to create this kind of a pitch deck and send it to us. Mm -hmm. And that's where I first learned, okay, so this is what I got to do. The email, which I sent out to the majority of people, that template is not going to work here. So I find people online, of course, just like, you know, <laughs> the way anyone should. And basically what I try to do is that rather than DMing them on Insta or wherever, I try to email them. I feel that emails are more effective because it shows up on their inbox right away. And the thing is that they do look at it majority because I do see the open rate on emails to be quite high. Of course, they don't get back to me, but that's that's a separate thing altogether, yeah. right? So other thing, I also think that going forward, if I do end up increasing my audience and things like that, I can always go back to them and say that, hey, this is how I've grown. What do you think? So I don't take rejections personally. I never do because at the end of the day, there has to be some kind of value which they get out of it. Yeah. There was something my mom would always say whenever I'd be like nervous about asking her to do something or to go somewhere. She'd be like, the answer's already no, unless you ask. If you ask, the answer might be yes. I don't know if it'll be yes, but it might be yes. And so I think that it's so important to just put yourself out there and to make the ask. You mentioned your follow-up, and I believe you mentioned two emails. What does that kind of look like? Because I know for myself, when people pitch me and I have PR firms pitching me their people to be on my show and things like mm. that, which is great. Also, I'm running a business at the same time. So I'm a busy person. I don't owe it. Like, I'll check the email. Oh, yeah, 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 that person looks good. I might save it for later, or I might just keep going with what I was doing at that time. And then they follow up and they say, hey, we submitted this form. Are you looking at guests still? Do you have another guest in mind? And then, oh yeah, yes, absolutely. I'm going to do that right now. Let me let my executive assistant know that I definitely want to have you on or that I definitely want to have your person on. What does your follow-up strategy kind of look like for that? You're so right that PR firms are reaching out, whether it be through Facebook, whether they're just emailing me. And it was very rare, obviously, in the first few months maybe once a month or something like that. But now I'm getting about four or five a week. So I know that in some ways it has picked up some kind of traction somewhere, right? People are watching, right? And and they do find some value in there. But unfortunately, I have not been able to find one guest through the inbound ones mm. because I find that that doesn't go well with my show, so to yeah. speak. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to say, and I know that I'm going to talk about the follow up email, but I wanted to mention one thing before I forget is that there have been a lot of quote unquote high profile people that I had an intake with. So basically what I do is that I have an intake Zoom with them and then we set a time for the recording that way we can prepare and things like that. And these gentlemen, they run very large companies, both of them. They have eight-figure, nine-figure businesses. They are very large. But recently, they have come out with their book, like they have written a book, and they want to promote their book. They don't want to talk about their business, which my audience is interested in. They don't want to talk about their revenue. They don't want to talk about their marketing strategies, none of that stuff. That is what basically the entirety of my interview is about surrounding those topics. So the thing is that 
if you don't want to talk about any of these things and you just want to promote your book, then this is not the right podcast for you. Yes. So I feel bad in the sense that, yes, I'm losing out on a very high profile guest because their name carries a lot of value and there's a lot of traction there already. But the thing is that they're not going to be adding any value to my audience. Similarly, I had of course, I'm not going to mention any names, right? But I had a person reach out and this person had about 9 million followers on Insta. And that is massive, right? And it, their PR reached out and they said, you know what? This person has come up with a new site or whatever it was. But the thing is that what this person was doing life coaching or whatever, various different aspects to that, right? So the thing is that whatever this person was doing, this person would not be able to add value to my audience because my audience are people who actually run businesses. Yeah, They're not a personal brand. They can't go out there and leverage and make millions, so to speak, right? So I thought long and hard, and that was especially when I, you know, a few months ago when I didn't have so much traction. The thing is that that could have added a lot of different things. But instead of that, I went with a guest who would be aligned with what my audience profile is all about, right? So going back to the email follow-up, what I try to do is that right now, unless they have committed, like a lot of people, they just write, yeah, I'm good to go. That's it. And they will just respond to the email. But then when I send them an email saying that, hey, let's set up the introductory Zoom. Let's go from there. Just crickets. I don't hear nothing back. Yeah. So the thing is that that's when I do follow up. Some people, for example, I'm trying to have a very popular photographer, a wedding photographer, come on. And the thing is that I know that this is, you know, wedding season. So he told me in, June that, yeah, let's do this uh, end of summer. So I have sort of followed up with him twice, but I have not heard back. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to follow up sometime in October, November, when I know that his season is completely done. Because I know he's looking at my messages, but obviously he's like super busy. I can tell from his stories, like he's super busy. So the thing is that I don't want to seem like a pest or, you know, just bothering people. But the thing is that also the tone of the email or the message has to be, it doesn't have to be like very formal. You told me that you were going to connect <laughs> with me and you didn't, blah, blah. It's, it's nothing like that. Yeah. You know, the tone has to be more casual and it has to be like within a couple of lines, I feel. Yeah, you have to infuse yourself into your emails, especially pitches, right? Because you want to make sure that what they're kind of getting right off the bat, that energy that they're getting is very similar to how you're going to show up at the interview. You can't just be right. like suit and tie in the email and then, you know, like myself, show up with a Star Wars t-shirt. Uh, it's the all interview. good. <laughs> it's all good. This has been so incredible, Tarek. You have been so insightful on like, Really, I feel like this whole interview has been about putting your audience first and making sure that the value that you're bringing to them is aligned and the guests are aligned and everything just makes sense for the journey that you want to take your audience on. Can you tell everyone where they can find you, hang out with you, watch your show, get to know you more? Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm on YouTube where the S factor, the shortcut is the S factor three. And that's where all my content is. Of course, I'm on Spotify as well. But the thing is that majority of the effort that I put into this sort of hobby project of mine goes uh, directly towards YouTube. So that is the best place to find me. Of course, I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. But uh, Insta is, again, the S Factor 3. And on TikTok, we are the success factor. Perfect. And we'll make sure that we link all of that in the show notes for anyone who is driving while listening or busy doing other things. So you can always go to the show notes to get more information on that. Again, thank you so much, Tarek. Thank you so much. This was a blast.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Listeners to Leads. If you found something in this episode valuable, I would really appreciate it if you shared it with a friend who you know would also get value from it. Want to send me a message? My favorite place to hang out is Instagram. You can find me at alicia.lottie. Let me know what your favorite takeaway was from the episode. And don't forget, turning those listeners into leads is actually easy.